steam. You can feel it blasting up from below the sidewalk in some parts of Philadelphia. It's like a hot breath from the past. Steam power was once a cutting edge technology, but like a lot of new tech, it didn't change things overnight. Transformation came in fits and starts, and some of the things that we like to blame on steam power, like ruthless factories and child labor, were actually around long before steam revolutionized industry. Steam power did dramatically change transportation, but when it first arrived, it felt more like chaos, where old and new technology fought it out on the street. This is about the people of Philadelphia in the 1830s and 40s, how they fared in the face of change and what they won and lost in the streets. This is Found in Philadelphia, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Philly's past so that we can better understand the present because our history matters. I'm your host, Lori Almond. With each episode, I hope that you'll learn something new, see things a little differently, and be inspired to go discover some of this history for yourself right here in the city of brotherly love. This is the fifth episode in a series about the history of Philadelphia streets. This one's all about changes that began in the 1830s. A booming immigrant population settled in an expanding city, attracted by growing industry within an increasingly connected region. It was an era of upheaval and downright exploitation, and much of this played out on the street. If you haven't listened to the last episode about street life in the early 1800s, I highly recommend you listen to it to help put this episode into perspective. And if you're looking for historical images, don't forget to check out the companion blog for each episode on the podcast website at foundinphiladelphia.com. Before we get on with the story, I wanted to let you know about a way you can support the podcast and help out your favorite independent bookstore at bookshop.org. First, go to the Found in Philadelphia podcast bookstore at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash found in Philly. There you can shop for books that inspired the podcast. Before you check out, don't forget to choose a bookstore at the top of your screen. Bookshop will give 10% of your order to the podcast and another 10% to the bookstore of your choice. I'll drop a link in the episode notes. Thank you. In the last episode, we looked at street life in the early 1800s in Philadelphia. Back then, the streets were intensely social places where people met and worked and celebrated The streets offered opportunity, but were also dangerous, especially for the city's Black community. Respectable society used street theater to put the working classes in their place. So in retaliation, the working class took back the streets in order to upend respectable society's roles. Philly streets were like a roiling pot of pepper pot stew, where ingredients from across the Atlantic were thrown together to make something new and complex. In this episode, we'll see how the city and its people were changing and what that looked like from the streets. Let's start with a view of the city in 1830. At this point, the city of Philadelphia was just the area that we now call Center City today. From south to Vine Streets, from river to river, the eastern half of the city and its Delaware River suburbs formed a dense crescent-shaped settlement of nearly 170,000 people. City development had reached to Broad Street and stretched north and south into the suburbs along the Delaware River, just across city lines, north into Northern Liberties and Kensington, and south into Southwark and Moyamensing. The docks on the Delaware River were still the major economic driver of the city, and people needed to live near enough to walk to work. And much of that work still revolved around the Delaware. Residents continued to live in crowded conditions, with wealthier residents living in larger houses on the main streets and poorer residents overflowing the much smaller houses in back alleys and courts. In the 1830s and 40s, the Philly region's population more than doubled, growing from 170,000 to over 225,000 in 1840, and then hitting 388,000 in 1850. Most of this population explosion was fueled by immigration. In 1830, foreign-born residents made up only 10% of the population. But 20 years later, 
The Philadelphia region was a place where immigrants made up nearly 30% of the population. And as more and more people settled in Philly, development in the area that we know as Center City moved westward along the spine of Market Street. And by the 1850s, Center City had almost filled out its grid of streets from the Delaware to the Schuylkill River. All of this immigration had a huge impact on who lived in the city. A great number of the recent foreign immigrants were Irish and Catholic, who were fleeing desperate poverty and famine in Ireland. This period was, in fact, the highest point of Irish immigration to the United States ever, and many of those Irish immigrants came to Philly. And even though we like to celebrate our Irish heritage today, back then, these poor Irish Catholics were unwelcome. But still, they came. So by 1850, Philadelphia was more foreign-born and more Catholic than it had ever been. What was it like to walk around in this changing city? This period is captured in some of the earliest photographs of Philly. You'll find some of them at the Found in Philadelphia website. In these small, dark photographs, the streets of the city are paved with cobblestones of all different sizes, at least where they were paved. Sometimes it's hard to tell because even where the streets were paved, they're covered in this thick layer of dark mud. Long slabs of stone were integrated into the cobblestone paving at street crossings to create a kinder passage across the cobbles for human feet. And these crossings were kept reasonably clear of mud, at least they appear to be in some of these very early photographs. But considering that the streets were full of horses, all of this muck must have made the streets smell like a stable and desperate need of cleaning. The footways, or what we call sidewalks, were set with stone curbs and either brick or stone paving. On commercial streets, merchandise from the stores overflowed onto the sidewalk. Stores displayed their goods on shelves set within large bay windows. Bolts of cloth and ready-made clothing hung down on either side of doorways. Big barrels of sugar and coffee and fruit packed the sidewalk. Poles lined the curb and held up fabric awnings that stretched from building to curb, shading the entire sidewalk. Newspaper boys staked out their spots to sell their daily papers. Big crowded omnibus carriages, carrying as many as 30 passengers, jolted along the streets behind teams of four horses. All kinds of foods and services were provided by the street sellers some with goods in baskets, and others with wheelbarrows or carts. At night, there was something new. Up until this point, Philadelphia streetlights had been fueled by whale oil, produced by the New England whaling industry. But gas produced from coal offered a much cheaper alternative. Even though gas lights still needed to be lit individually, and the lantern glass had to be cleaned regularly because the coal gas left behind a greasy black soot. But gaslighting could be more efficient because it was created at a central facility and then fed to the rest of the city. The city's first coal gas plant was built at Market Street on the Schuylkill River in 1835. There it had access to coal coming down by canal from Northeast Pennsylvania. The plant provided gas within the two square miles of Center City through a system of iron pipes laid under Philadelphia streets. Our second utility was born and the streets of Philadelphia grew brighter at night as gas street lighting expanded through the 1850s. So where does steam come into this story? Well, it doesn't, not yet. I had always thought that steam power came along and large factories were born, but it didn't really happen that way. The technology for steam power actually reached the American colonies in the 1760s, but it took a while for steam to revolutionize industry. That really didn't happen until the 1870s. Back where we are in the 1830s, Philadelphia was pioneering the commercial production of steam engines. That's true, but these early steam engines were stationary. They were small, low-powered devices that stayed in one place and might be used to power a small shop. They were also pretty expensive to run and couldn't power a large factory. But bigger factories were being built, and these were being powered by water. Economic forces were beginning to shift in the 1830s. Philadelphia's economy was just starting to move away from being completely focused on shipping and trade. The city had always made most of its money at the docks and wharves, 
where ships loaded and unloaded their goods, and in the warehouses and counting houses where merchants engaged in trade. Now the region was developing the beginnings of a manufacturing economy where we made stuff. Early Philadelphia factories transformed raw materials from inland Pennsylvania into products for both local consumers and the domestic markets of New York, Baltimore, and Boston. The way workers in Philadelphia made things was moving from a small workshop system led by skilled craftsmen towards a larger scale factory-centered system. And this factory system was more and more centered on machines and they required two types of workers. First, these factories needed a small number of skilled mechanics who understood and could repair machines. Second, factories needed a much larger number of unskilled laborers who did the difficult and repetitive manual labor that kept the factory running. This was the beginning of a major change in how Philadelphia worked, but change came unevenly in these early years, dominating some industries and barely impacting others. One industry that was rapidly turning to machines in the 1830s was the textile industry. And some of the largest textile factories of that era were developed along the newly opened Schuylkill Navigation Company Canal in Maniunk. And you can still see many of these mill buildings and a remnant of that canal in Maniunk today. Maniunk's large water-powered mills grew and thrived on the cheap, unskilled labor provided by the poor Irish Catholic immigrants who were arriving during this period. The Irish were fleeing from really desperate conditions in the north and west of Ireland, areas with little industry. They arrived with experience in fishing and farming, but no experience with factory work. There was also a very strong anti-Catholic bias in mostly Protestant Philadelphia. So the Irish Catholics had little choice but to take on the toughest, unskilled jobs available. These were in the factories or in building the canals that allowed America's early industry to grow. Now, I think it's important to stop and take a look at what it was like in these early factories so that we understand the extraordinary events in Philly streets that took place next. The early industrialized factory system was extremely grim. In fact, working conditions in the early industrialized mills of Maniunk were so bad that they were investigated in 1837 by the Pennsylvania Senate. And this investigation survives as a record of just how bad things were. The mill owners in this period were beginning to invest in machines, what they called labor-saving devices, that replaced skilled male workers with unskilled ones, who were mostly women and children. Plus, women and children were seen as being easier to control, less militant, and they were also cheaper. Children earned about 50 cents a week, while women earned from 50 cents to $2.50 a week. In contrast, a skilled male spinner earned 6 to $7.50 a week. By 1840, a quarter of Philadelphia's textile workers were concentrated in the large Maniunk mills. And the vast majority of these mill workers from two-thirds to up to three-quarters, were women and children. Children under 12 alone made up almost 10% of the workforce. Working conditions were brutal. They worked a 72-hour week, putting in an average of 12 hours a day, six days a week. Though one mill pushed workers to do 14-hour days in the summer months. From the Senate investigation, we know that the conditions were exceptionally harsh because they provided specific information about children. Nine-year-old children were kept on their feet for 12 hours, carrying boxes as heavy as 16 pounds up and down four stories, or these children spent those hours bent over weaving frames. Mills were not ventilated and the dust and fluff in the air could cause permanent lung damage. Dangerous open gears and machines were rarely guarded to prevent injuries that could kill or maim workers for life. But the mill workers were desperate, especially the recent Irish immigrants who needed every family member to help out. So parents went from mill to mill, begging the factories to hire their children to work in these oppressive conditions. Mill owners conspired to standardize harsh work rules. So workers couldn't leave one mill to try and find better conditions at another. If you were 15 minutes late, you automatically lost a quarter of the day's wages. If you were absent a day, you lost two days' wages. And employers held on to two weeks' worth of wages in case a worker quit without permission. 
though employers had the right to fire a worker arbitrarily. And mill owners maintained a blacklist that could shut out a worker from finding employment at another mill. Outside of the factories, mill owners failed to use their influence to improve the everyday lives of their workers. The streets of Maniunk were not paved in this period, and there was no street lighting or regular trash collection. For those of you who have never been to Maniunk, its streets are incredibly steep. It's the home of the notorious Maniunk Wall, a half-mile stretch of road that rises over 200 feet at a grade of 8 to 17 percent. These streets are tough enough to navigate now. Imagine the mill workers rushing down the hill to work on dark, dirty, and unpaved streets, terrified of being 15 minutes late. So abusive factory conditions were well underway in Philadelphia, long before steam revolutionized industry. But these awful conditions helped organize labor from different trades across the city. And their protests took over the streets of Philly. Philadelphia already had a long history of labor strikes, or what they called standouts, by individual trade groups. The weavers might go on strike or the tailors. What was remarkable in this period was the variety of workers who united across different trades. They were coming together for the first time. Craftsmen who owned their own shops, laborers who worked the docks, those who took in piecework at home, as well as the growing factory workforce. In fact, the Maniunk Mills were the center of organizing many of these factory workers into a union. One of the nation's earliest citywide coalition of labor groups was formed here in Philadelphia in 1827. It was called the Mechanics Union of Trade Associations. They created a labor movement that brought together unskilled laborers and factory workers, as well as highly skilled mechanics and craftsmen by focusing on issues they could all agree on. Their platform was centered on a host of reforms that we take for granted today. They wanted to limit working hours. In this period, they were fighting for a maximum 10-hour workday. They wanted to get rid of compulsory militia training that forced them to lose days of work. They wanted free public schools, no more imprisonment for debt, and the adoption of a mechanics lien law, which protected workers from non-payment. Employers and their pro-business sympathizers fought back. Both sides took the fight to the streets. They used public meetings, celebrations, and demonstrations to rally support. This early trade association was short-lived, but it set a blueprint for building future coalitions of workers. Despite some early setbacks, labor regrouped across industries and across the nation in the 1830s. The ongoing conditions in the Maniac Mills alone showed that more needed to be done to protect workers. This led to the highly coordinated labor strike in June of 1835 in Philadelphia that shut down the city. The strike started in the heart of Philadelphia's economic engine, its docks, specifically the docks on the Schuylkill River. Remember, that was where coal from the Northeast was being unloaded. It was here that coal heavers left work and paraded through the streets in protest. Coal heaving was one of the dirtiest, low-skilled jobs, but it was essential for keeping trade moving. And you won't be surprised to hear that many coal heavers were Irish. What was amazing was what happened next. In solidarity, highly skilled workers like carpenters and shoemakers, printers and bakers, joined with the coal heavers, taking to the streets to make clear what their demands were. For a week, Working men from all walks of life joined together and marched in militia-like processions through their neighborhoods. This was the first general strike in U.S. history. Different groups crisscrossing each other in the grid of streets, but always ending at Independence Hall to connect their cause to that of the American Revolution. The strike was a success. Philadelphia's Common Council approved the 10-hour workday and wage increases soon after. And the Philly strike inspired other workers to demand a 10-hour workday in their cities. But I'm afraid many of these hard-won concessions were lost after the crushing economic collapse of 1837. The fallout from this collapse hit Philadelphia hard and caused the failure of several Philly banks, including the Bank of the United States of Pennsylvania, whose building is still standing at 4th and Chestnut. Unemployment soared in the city, 
It's been estimated that unemployment in Philadelphia fluctuated between 25% to a staggering 40%. To put that in perspective, the worst unemployment rate during the pandemic was just over 14%. And unemployment only ever reached 25% during the Great Depression of the 1930s. So the devastating 1837 panic and its aftermath sapped the strength of the labor unions, at least for now. Though the movement brought workers together, for the first time they felt like a distinct group, the producers, the working class. And their voices in the street started an ongoing dialogue about how to improve the lives of workers in America. So we've looked at how the city, its people, and its streets were changing. We saw how the economy was slowly shifting towards manufacturing with the growth of large water-powered factories. Philly's early factories didn't need steam to become grim, soul-sucking abuses of power. They were capitalizing on cheap immigrant workers and brutal child labor long before steam-powered factories took off. But early factory conditions helped galvanize the city's working class across trades, and they formed an effective general strike for the first time in the United States. They took over the streets, achieved a complete city shutdown, and won. But the Panic of 1837 undercut their gains. So now, steam. While steam power was not revolutionizing industry during the 1830s, steam was about to transform transportation. So if you've been wondering when this history of streets was going to get around to trains, well, it's right now. A lot of things had to come together to develop railroads in the United States. There were steam-powered engines, vehicles moving along rails, and then finally, bringing it all together, steam-powered locomotives running on rails. By the 1830s, Philadelphia was already America's center for building stationary steam engines. And the Philly region boasted the largest concentration of small-scale steam-driven industries in the United States. This was in large part because of the legacy of Oliver Evans, a Delaware-born inventor who worked for many years in Philadelphia. In 1790, Evans patented his stationary high-pressure steam engine that would mechanize some labor-intensive work, like milling grain, crushing limestone, and cutting wood. Evans was a visionary who did in fact build a working steam-powered amphibious vehicle for dredging. This thing must have crawled out of the river onto Philly streets like some primordial version of the automobile, but nothing ever came of it, apart from some great publicity. In 1806, Evans established the Mars Iron Works to build and sell his stationary steam engines. And Evans' sons would later move the Mars Iron Works to the outskirts of Center City on Spring Garden Street. And this neighborhood would become a kind of innovation hub, attracting top-tier iron workers, engineers, and mechanics. Railways were actually built in the United States before we had moving steam engines or locomotives to run on them. Rails were laid down to improve the hauling of heavy materials, especially for transporting coal in Pennsylvania's Northeast Mountains. Freight cars were pulled by animals or moved by gravity downhill. The Library of Congress has records of this type of railway built near Swarthmore in 1809 to haul stone. Moving steam engines or locomotives that could pull heavy loads along these railways were first developed in Great Britain in the 1820s. Entrepreneurs in the United States were soon laying track for these locomotives in the 1830s. But the United States wasn't quite ready to produce moving steam engines. The earliest locomotive steam engines in the United States were imported from England in pieces, like IKEA furniture, and they had to be put back into working condition once they arrived. Philadelphia craftsmen like James Harrison and Matthias Baldwin helped to reconstruct these British locomotive steam engines, but they were soon innovating their own designs to build locomotives that were adapted for American rails. In 1835, both the Norris and the Baldwin Locomotive Works opened nearby the Mars Iron Works on Spring Garden, just west of Broad. From here, Philadelphia would become a leader in making American locomotives well into the 20th century. Throughout the 1830s, Philadelphia was feverishly granting charters for railroads in competition with New York City and Baltimore. The race was on to connect these cities to each other and to the raw products from farther afield. This early period was like a messy startup with lots of small investors building short rail lines to carry freight or to transport passengers. 
Nothing was coordinated and many early railroad ventures failed. But in this early period, lots of railroad companies were laying track on Philadelphia streets at a rapid pace. You may want to have a map handy for this next bit. Here are just a few of the earliest railways, and many are still in use or have left their mark on the city. The Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown Railroad ran north along 9th Street before branching off to the northwest. The Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad snaked west from the Delaware along Willow Street and then crossed over the Schuylkill River on a new bridge and inclined plane system near Belmont Plateau. The Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad entered from the south, chugged through a deep cut at Bartram's Gardens, crossed the Schuylkill, and then headed east to the Delaware along what we now call Washington Avenue. And railroad tracks were laid right down Broad Street to connect the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad on the north to the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad to the south. And when I say rails were laid down on Philly streets, that's exactly how this worked. Rails were run right on top of existing streets. We're used to trains having their own routes, separate from where most of us walk or drive, but these early railroads ran right along the street. Imagine the appearance of these loud hissing and smoking locomotives pumping along right at street level. Now, these were early contraptions and not the huge engines that would come later. To us, they might look kind of cute. They were basically a long cylinder on wheels with a skinny smokestack up front and a bell-shaped boiler behind with a small open-air platform for the engineer in back. And they ran at top speeds of maybe 30 miles an hour. But they were still powered by steam engines, which had a nasty habit of exploding and killing people. For the average person on the street, these new locomotives must have been more than a little bit terrifying. But for the city merchants whose businesses were centered along the Delaware docks, the only question for them was how quickly they could connect their docks to this growing regional rail network. They were clamoring for more rail lines to run through the center of town, where warehouses and factories stood right next to homes and churches. But many people weren't happy about having the railroad take over their streets. And people really saw the trains as taking over their streets. Here is Professor Michael Kahn, urban studies professor at Stanford University, who's describing a 19th century illustration of Philly streets. In this illustration, you see people standing, socializing in the middle of the street. You see children playing. You see chickens and goats. You see a, a girl with her little, what looks like her little baby sibling. You see people kind of lounging on the stoops, leaning against lamp posts. And so people were really using this whole street as a space of socializing. You would also have seen people using it for economic activity, people selling things, children peddling, selling newspapers, people sawing wood or, or selling hay. I mean, there were, there were whole professions, boot blacks and, and shoe shiners who would have worked outdoors on the street. And this heavy use of the street gave residents a real sense of ownership of the roadway outside their doors. They believed that the streets belonged to the people, not to private railway companies. In fact, in 1842, Kensington residents kept the railroad from extending along Front Street in their part of town by tearing up the freshly laid tracks and blocking the streets. When the railroad company gave up, they celebrated in the streets with slogans like, free passage to all, and the Constitution protects the people in the use of their highways. But these victories were rare. Within the two square miles of Center City, what was then the city of Philadelphia, the push for more rail lines was relentless. In response, the city of Philadelphia created a joint committee on highways in 1835. This new committee was in charge of paving and repairing streets, but it was also given the authority to appoint a superintendent of railroads who would help the city connect its docks in the Delaware to the growing railroad network. After some debate in 1838, the city approved a new rail line that ran right through the heart of the city. This rail line connected to the existing railroad on Broad Street, then ran east down Market Street to Third, then went south down Third Street to Dock Street, and then along Dock Street to the Delaware River. But this put the railway on a collision course with one of the most popular places in the city, the open-air market, which gave Market Street its name. 
And this contest would set the tone for who actually had the right to use the public street in the future. The market along Market Street had attracted shoppers since colonial times. Here's Michael Kahn again. Market Street is called that because it was the home to these public marketplaces. The buildings themselves were built in the street, not on the lots abutting the street. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like Reading Terminal Market where you, you know, you go into a building that's near the street corner, you would be on the street. There would be these shelters right in the middle of the street. And that's where the markets would take place. And that's where, you know, many, many Philadelphians got their provisions up through the 1850s. At their peak, the open-air market sheds ran down the center of the street from Front Street at the Delaware all the way to 8th Street. Official vendors sold things within the market sheds, while the surrounding streets and sidewalk were taken over by unofficial vendors on market days. The sheds along Market Street attracted an estimated 400 of these informal sellers in mid-century. Now add in a railroad to Market Street and you have a real mess. For the next 20 years, Market Street was part railroad, part marketplace, and part carriageway. Market Street from 3rd to 8th had market sheds running down the center of the street, a rail line on the northern half, and a roadway to the south. Though the city did rule that no locomotives could enter into the city boundaries at this point, they would be switched out for horses at the city limits. But you still had horses pulling railroad cars down Market Street to stop and load and unload at warehouses along the street. The city had to hire someone to direct traffic. And on market days, you couldn't get the rail cars through with all of the people and wagons and horses plus the street sellers and newsboys in the streets around the market sheds. The merchants had succeeded in connecting the docks and the city center to the larger regional railroad network, but they had to fight against long-standing traditions of street use to get it. But Philadelphia's open-air markets and urban railroads were on a collision course that we'll look at in future episodes. The streets of Philadelphia from 1830 to 1850 had a lot going on. The city and its economy were growing and changing, and the streets reflected the struggles of the city's residents during uncertain times and economic downturns. A united worker strike took to the streets, closed down the city in an effort to improve the lives of everyday people. Railroads brought trains right onto Philly's streets, which threatened the old ways of streets as places for people. During these decades leading up to the Civil War, Philadelphia's streets were explosive. All of these changes fueled violence on the streets, and a major movement was underway in city government to try to get things under control. But that's the story for the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Found in Philadelphia podcast. If you're enjoying this series, please drop me a review and share the podcast with a friend. And please check out the podcast website to learn more see some period images and find a list of my sources. They're all there. This podcast was research written, hosted, recorded, and edited by me, Lori Ament. Cyril Tayendi is the amazing audio engineer who leads the Community Recording Collective at Drexel University.